three uh, witnesses uh, who have also been very generous in their time is uh, Richard Blakeway, Simon Holden, and Tony Griffiths, who uh, who are the landlords of London, or at least something to do with the, <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> the land of London. So uh, I'm very grateful for, uh, for, for you taking the time, and I really want to focus on the estate side. You know, on one hand, people say we're sitting on a you know, huge mm -hmm. amount of state in the NHS that is not utilized uh, either for health value or in economic value. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, there are all sorts of challenges and obstacles, for example, in finding uh, a state to develop our primary care infrastructure, which is falling apart in London. So uh, could we start with you with some thoughts and we'll then ask you some questions. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to spend five minutes yep. explaining who we are, setting some of the context and, and coming back to you. And th these were thoughts I put down over the weekend. Um, the first one, and really I shouldn't be telling you this, you know, is the majority of interventions goes on in primary care and whether it's 90%, but it is important. I think I, I agree with Candice about the pressures. I've said it's financial pressures, and I think that's revenue, that's day-to-day -day rather than capital cost. There is capital in the system, but it's paying for that capital. And then demographics, and again, I've got, there's lots of stats, and the ones I use were all off the Kingsfund website. Um, and then there was something in the press over the weekend about life expectancy. You know, in Wirral, it's 66 for a boy. In Westminster, it's 96. Now, that was this Sunday's papers. We all know the 65 to 85s are going to grow by a third. The over 85s with comorbidities are going to grow by one and a third in the next 20 years. So the pressure and the need to, to keep people uh, safe in the community is primary care. When you get on to the, the sort of the estates issues, the figure we use as NHS property services is one square metre costs about £350 a year outside London. And, and one square metre is about the size of a filing cabinet. So and then the stats we've got is £400 a square metre in London and £900 per square metre in central London. So that is to maintain? What, just what to keep that it for one year, lease, uh, heat, okay. rates. Yeah. Okay. So you look at a room like this, it's costing a lot of money. Yeah. You know, that's... Um, I think when you get into property... Um, the answer has got to be in an innovation. So whether it's working on Section 106, you know, developers passing money across, I think it's using residential and retail when we do build primary care centres to reduce the ongoing cost. You often see primary care centres, and I speak nationally rather than specifics, but with nothing above them, you know, they are an island. I think the other thing, and then again, this is some of this is a personal view, is about multifunction rooms, about getting away from that's the district nurse's room, that's the physio room, that's the podiatrist room, to saying we have multifunction rooms that are used as much as we can, looking at other things like pharmacists and then build, building in expansion space. And that's, that's not space that sp stands empty, but it could be a coffee shop on a shorter term lease that should the practice grow, it can push out. Um, London's different, and I think uh, we, use, we say that quite often. In London, lift, 29 of the 31 boroughs are lift, so the sister company to NHS Property Services, and Sam is a non-exec with them. Um, your, your opening comments on NHS property services and who we are, we're 11.5% of the estate nationally and it was the PCT estate that was lifted and shifted and the things that Acute Trust didn't want to take came to us. I think in London I've tried to recut that figure and we're about 8.5% of the London estate so we're not the massive player but what we do do is hopefully provide the strategic support to CCGs when they come up with a clinical strategy. Um, the enablers, we've got the NHS outcomes framework that everyone's working on now. I think the first cut's due in February, second cut round about December. Disposals, we're still on that. Um, supporting the government to free up 100,000 housing units by March 15. But irrespective of that priority, and again, I speak nationally, we've got 200 sites which cost £12 million a year to hold, which is surplus and vacant. 
So that's NHS money that's been used to hold surplus assets, cut the grass, security, and that's money that should be spent on healthcare. So the driver for me is if an asset is surplus, it should be sold because there's a holding cost in holding it. You mentioned earlier health and wellbeing boards. I, I think they are the key to planning, and it's always a balance between sort of coordination and complexity. So we can get onto some of the specifics like Dulwich, but you get into free schools and primary care, and as more things come, they become more complex to deliver. Um, and, and, and finally, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. I think Andy Burnham's got a great expression, which is, again, irrespective of politics, is hide the wiring, which I think Candy said about make the seams very tight. I think whoever is providing the services, it, it shouldn't be seen by the patients. Thank you very much for that. And, colleague, any, any others? Um, can Please, I say a few briefly. words? Because yep. I represent a different yep. organisation, yep. uh, the GLA, which doesn't have... Um, a direct um, interest in the existing NHS estate, although Absolutely. it is, has been responsible for handling the redevelopment of five um, former hospital estates um, um, across London. Um, I just want to um, sketch out our perspective on, on, on particularly around the disposals or, or, or the maximisation of the opportunity that NHS estates uh, represent. And I think it, this is important to be seen in the context of London as a changing city. As we, as we know, with population projected of um, 10 million, it will be, um, uh, there will only be two cities in Europe with a population large, in Moscow and Istanbul. Um, so, so in Western Europe, London will be the largest city, and this puts a real pressure on services, as we know, on schools and also on, on housing. Um, and the real challenge for us, and obviously I have responsibility for housing at the GLA, the real challenge for us is to double the number of homes being built. And this is very important for our economic performance, but also for people's well-being. And, and, and the important thing, which isn't recognised fully, is that to double housing, that doesn't mean tweaking the existing system, because the existing system will roughly deliver you half the number of homes that you need. Um, it's coming up with something entirely new. And it's absolutely right that in coming up with something entirely new, public assets are, are, are looked at, surplus public land is, is, is looked at. And um, um, the GLA is a, a, a probably the largest public landowner in, in London, but its intention is to um, exit all of its sites or have an exit strategy for all of its sites within this mayor's current term, so by 2016. Um, for a number of years, that... That, that land supply, if you like, has been an important part of the development and regeneration of, of, of London. I reference that there are five hospital sites, many of which I'm sure you know from a former psychiatric hospital in Cane Hill through to you know, St. Clement's Hospital in, 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 in Mile End. Um, so this has been an important part of the story. By 2016, it will, there will be a real challenge about, well, what next? And... I think there's a real frustration, sense of frustration, both on the part of the mayor and, and, and indeed government, around um, the ability to get other public landowners to look at their assets. And that frustration is probably most acute, and it's no reflection of a NHS property, by the way. Um, it's probably most acute with the, with, with the NHS. Um, and I think there's, a, there's just a number of things, which observations, which I um, like to make. Um, um, and, and these are recommendations, in a sense, which, or, or thoughts which the Commission may want to consider. Um, I think the first is that, in many cases, the NHS, it would appear, doesn't really know what it wants the estate to do itself. Um, and there seems to be real uh, confusion over um, who is responsible for making that decision. Um, and, um, it, uh, and it's occurred on some of the assets which we handled, and Greenwich Hospital is an asset which you well, there was a very long debate with the lift about who, what happens with clinical reprovision on that site. And, it, and it's a real challenge when um, there's seemingly a lack of clarity and lack of clarity on who makes the decision around um, assets and the future of those assets. Um, the second is obviously the capital flows from those assets and um, the capital receipts from those assets and who retains those. And there's obviously a, a, a view within the GLA that... Um, um, there should be a greater incentive for London to retain those capital receipts to then be able to reinvest in services um, within London. Um, the next um, um, issue which I'd like to raise is procurement. 
Um, and, and obviously, there is an obligation to, uh, uh, to use, um, if disposing of asset, to, to use an OGU compliant procurement process unless the worst option is taken, which is just to sell it on the open market, which is, which is definitely the worst option because it doesn't produce best value and it can often lead to that asset simply being traded in the property market where there's obviously in London a significant amount of speculation. So you want to use some form of procurement so you get best value but also can have some certainty and drive the outcomes. Um, and to simplify those procurement processes, there are many frameworks, not least the GLA's own property framework, which was procured with the NHS. Um, um, and it, but at the moment, only one trust has signed up to use that. Um, and that's a real concern to us because it shows that if there is a big push around disposals, and it would appear to be the case because I think about 110 hectares has gone through planning in London, NHS land has gone through planning in London to, to, to be reconfigured in some way. Um, so there is obviously work going on, but, but there's insufficient use of, of um, cost-effective and, and, and the best disposal. And that that's, presents a real concern, both in terms of, as I say, best value, but also getting those outcomes. Now, NHS Property Company, we've got an emerging and strong relationship with them where, where they have um, leverage over the land to, to, to use the London Development Panel, for example. But I think it should be an obligation of all trusts, and indeed every trust, should be not just NHS property company as, as prop co, but trust themselves to, to, to sign up to use these framework panels so that they are using the procurement process, prop, are using a procurement process and doing it properly. And then the final bit I would say is, is, is around foundations. And obviously there is a, you know, a drive to become, to, to achieve foundation status. And then um, what happens around that land is you know, largely the response, it becomes a responsibility of that foundation, and you can see the incentives there. But I do think it's, again, very incumbent on foundations to reach that status, to have a proper asset strategy and, and clarity around that. And there will still be some procurement obligations which should still be fulfilled. So I think that, I mean, just to conclude on my, my few comments, I think um, the GLA... Um, as I say, is a major landowner, um, inherited over 600 hectares from three different bodies in London. Um, in the rest of England, um, there's a clear drive from DCLG that HCA, the Homes and Communities Agency, takes on um, um, a, a wider role around um, the disposal of assets and the use of assets across the public sector. Um, in London, legislation um, prevents the, the, the HCA operating. It's the role of the GLA. Instead, it's the role of the the mayor. So, so the conversation with ministers and treasury is very much that that role is taken by the GLA. And then therefore, in order to do that, we, we were very keen to play this lead, leadership role. But in order to do that, we do, and, and, and there's a clear view that the opportunity exists with greatest with, with NHS assets, both to raise money for the NHS and to reprovide better clinical services and do other things. Um, but, but to play that leadership role, we do need a very new, uh, uh, we need a very different relationship with the NHS and a much clearer obligation on the NHS to engage with uh, the GLA. Thank you very much. That was very, very useful. Any uh, questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, um, I wonder if I might ask um, Simon a, a, a couple of questions. You referred to the uh, low proportion of property that PropCo own in London compared to outside. London. I wonder if you might just say a little bit about the other 91% who owns it and whether you see that as an uh, opportunity or a particular difficulty for London. And secondly, um, I think you referred to strategic planning. I was interested in, in PropCo's view in the new system, given the differential commissioning responsibilities from primary care, local authorities and uh, CCGs. Where do you see the strategic planning for NHS estates sitting at a lower level in the new system? Yeah. Um, I think the first one, ownership. Uh, Rich has touched on the point in that foundation trusts tend to own the big sites they sit on. In primary care, you can off there's still a mixed market with GPs can own their own uh, sites if, if they want. We tend to have the residual stuff. We've, uh, we do own a couple of big hospitals but a lot of our assets in London are small sites and also I was talking to Tony earlier the before 1948 so there's some, some quite old sites um, but I would argue it, it's trust both FT standalone trusts who are sitting on 
the assets, which I think was Rich's point. I think the second one on planning, um, we're trying to dovetail into the um, the NHS outcomes framework, and because there are 220 CCGs nationally, what we're trying to do is to work with CHP, our sister company, and um, we're c rather than aspire to produce an estate strategy, what we're saying is we'll, we'll try and work on producing an evidence pack to support an estate strategy. So something we can sort of aggregate at a regional level and nationally. So you would say, what are the short-term priorities in an area, the medium and the long-term and the disposals? And we're endeavouring to produce that. I think CCGs are working on um, first court um, clinical strategies by February we're probably March April time I look towards Tony to sort of either collate what's there or try and work out how to produce if it, is, if it isn't there because when I go out and talk to CCGs the number that say we're far more advanced than that we've got a really detailed estate strategy we've picked it up from the CCG we, we, we've got much more than that and I'm saying well if you have just let me have a summary of it in these easy to distill chapters. I'm yet to believe whether they are as well developed as they think they are, especially when you start looking at surplus and vacant properties. So when I said nationally there's 200 properties, they're ones which are vacant and the CCG has formally said the surplus. There are a lot more properties that are vacant, but a CCG hasn't currently declared its surplus. So I think we really have got to review the estate. Thank you. Sam? Yeah, it's, it's three questions, and you might want to take the answers outside. Sure. But um, the first one is um, you, you describe partly a vision for primary care, including pharmacy. Ara has done it very much in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our centres that we run in Tower Hamlets is a Darcy centre. Thinking about that and the vision for primary care, integrated care, all the strategies that are out there, what percentage of uh, primary care premises in London do you think are fit for purpose? A rough estimate. Uh, secondly, local authorities like Tower Hamlets have invested very strongly through what used to be Section 106 funding in primary care. That's quite unusual. Uh, do you have a sense of how widely that is happening throughout London? And finally, your issue about surplus estates, certainly in, in uh, Tower Hamlets, Queen Elizabeth Children's Hospital, which used to be part of Great Ormond Street, been empty, I, I suspect, for at least 10 years. Mm -hmm. So 15. what's... 15. Beg your pardon. 15 years and security costs during that time. Uh, what do you think is the average length that these uh, properties are sitting there surplus in London? In true politician fashion, <coughs> because they're all very detailed London questions. Can I pass it over to can, Tony? Can I just say, Simon, you did uh, rightly point out that I'm a director of Community Health Partnerships. Colloquially learn as lift, lift company. I just wanted to point that out to everybody. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in terms of the, the properties that are fit for purpose in primary care, um, the only figure that I've come across is the one that was represented in the call for action, which says that 30% are deemed to be substandard. I don't think we've got any extra information on that currently. And I think that supports the point that Simon made that there is a need to have some more data collection so that we truly understand who owns the estate, what condition it's in, where it is, and how we can then uh, plug that into the need to make services both accessible uh, and to ensure that they do enable a comprehensive delivery of services. So we do have to do the, that piece of work, but of course we need to do it in a timely manner and not spend years collecting data because we will lose the opportunity of making decisions. Okay. Um, in terms of 106s, if I want me to move on yeah. to that, I think it is mixed across London. Um, different boroughs have different approaches to 106s, so it works very well, particularly as you've indicated in your area. But I could take you to other parts of London where it is not working so well, and we have to work much, much harder with local authority colleagues and developers to ensure that money flows through the system. And in terms of the, uh, the average length that a building is held between perhaps being operational and being declared surplus 
and going onto the disposal system, I don't think anybody has got uh, a handle on that length of time at all. I don't think that data is collected anywhere in the system. Can I, is it yeah. possible to add just a quick response sure. on, on that? On the session 106, um, I, I think Tony's absolutely right, will be a mixed picture. I think what's interesting to look at, and the Commission may want to commission something around this, is, is the introduction of SIL, uh, which will gradually, in some places, phase out section 106, and SIL will make quite clear what they expect the, the returns to be spent on. What is SIL? Um, community infrastructure levy. And, um, um, and, that, and, that, and, and, and you'll get some sense of, well, what are the priorities for a local authority SIL? Is it affordable housing? Is it community facilities? And so on. So that might give you a sense of what the picture is like across London. It's important to stress that SIL's been phased in, so this is not every borough has a SIL policy yet. Um, secondly, on, on this issue about um, disposals, um, Queen Elizabeth is a really interesting example. Um, I know it because the asset formally transferred to the GLA in, um, in 2012. Um, I believe it was vacated as a hospital in 1995 or 1997. Um, but a decision was only, and, and, and you could certainly point to, you know, why with English partnerships who I think acquired it didn't more happen or all that, which is very, very fair. But I think what's really, really striking, it wasn't until 2010 that for absolute certainty, the absolute clarity, there was not going to be clinical reprovision as part of that site. So there seemed to be this 15-year period where actually the NHS itself was still deciding whether or not it wanted some form of clinical reprovision within the asset. Since it transferred to it, it now has a development partner, and it now has um, a planning application on it, and it should now be under the development um, start to be redeveloped as housing this, this year, this calendar year. I think, and that I think again demonstrates to me that um, these assets can ha have a re really important function in terms of regeneration and so on, and, and providing new homes and indeed clinical reprovision, as in the case of the Greenwich Hospital. But unfortunately, the NHS is not necessarily the best place to make sure that stuff happens on it. You can point across London at, at, at real challenges. Springfields will be another one which will continually come up. And you think, well, what is happening with this asset? So I do, you know, I really do feel that whether it's with NHS Propco or a combination of the GLA and, um, and the NHS, we, we do need to look at, well, what's being identified as surplus and, and how do we then utilise that asset? Um, if you look at the figures, there's 30 sites that have been identified by um, uh, the Department of Health uh, and, and the information has been given to DCLG for clinical reprovision. There's at least 20 hectares identified by local authorities as, as, um, uh, as they believe um, sites that could provide other services um, there. There's five trusts who have bid for funding from DCLG. Uh, I would give you the name, but it's not been signed off by ministers yet, but five trusts who have bid for funding to help dispose of sites so that they can... and, and, and um, um, you know, for other purposes. So there's clearly this huge amount of activity, but real confusion and lack of clarity over how, how it's happening um, a, a, across London, what the whole picture is across London. And I think a real question about why aren't those trusts or, or whoever has title to the land using a proper procurement process, using the frameworks that exist at the GLA, and, and, and so on. Okay, thank you. So I, was, I wanted to build on... on on that, you, you said when you were talking earlier about a different relationship with the NHS and the GLA on a state. Do you have a view about what that would look like practically? Well, I mean, I think uh, clearly there needs to be some thought as to what clinical purposes those sites still hold, and that, and, and there needs to be clarity about who's going to make that decision and when that decision is going to be made, because that often is the block on something happening. As I said with Queen Elizabeth Hospital, I think it's also fair to say that on the two sites which we're talking about with NHS Propco, um, St George's in Harm Church and Dulwich Hospital in Dulwich, or East Dulwich, um, you know, there's been a protracted debate on those sites about what the clinical provision. So the first thing surely is to work out, well, what is the clinical purposes of those sites? Uh, and then I think, unfortunately, the, the you can end up in um, a lack of decision to then get the site to market. So I think, you know, who makes that decision that it then comes to market? And then a very poor disposal process can take place, not on all sites, but on some sites, very, you know, and, and, and they'll fall out. 
and, and, and so I do think that um, certainly one of the things which we would like to do is if sites are identified as surplus, it's either NHS Propco or ourselves who, who then handle the disposal um, to make sure that actually we do get best value for, for the NHS and, and, and also get the outcomes on those sites that, that everyone wants because no one wants to look at a hospital that's sat there vacant for many, many years. Um, and I'm afraid that is the story across London. It's certainly the story with the five sites which we eventually inherited. Okay, all right. And can I ask you about um, distribution across? So there have been various attempts to look at underutilised estate in London previously, and they have been incomplete. But one thing that's very clear is a different pattern across London uh, in relation to uh, underutilised estate versus need, i.e. where the need for investment is may not be where the underutilised estate. Do you have a view about how that should be, should be managed? So if we overcome some of the things you're describing, there's an issue in my mind about how, how do you get investment in places where they haven't got underutilised estate versus places that have perhaps have more than their fair share? Um, I mean, I, I, I know Simon wants to come on on this. Um, I, I mean, I th I th it, it's probably beyond my skills to be able to say, well, how do you best use the site? The only thing I would say, though, is that there is, if there's an issue with capital receipts returning to central government, I think not even the DOH in some cases, but um, sometimes the Treasury, Treasury. Then Treasury. to the Treasury, then... You know, surely there is a question, therefore, about how you use those proceeds and how, uh, under a new system across Greater London, you would be able to use those proceeds from higher value areas or where there's great surpluses to reinvest into um, facilities where there is uh, poorer provision. And I think that's something we should be looked at. I mean, I think, just a slight comment back on your mm. previous question, I, you know, I mean, I... Certainly one of the things we're talking to government about is transferring assets from other public bodies in London to the GLA, as has happened. And I do, I am increasingly wondering whether that should be the case with NHS land as well, where it's identified as surplus. Were that to be the case, you could, I think there's a very strong question over, well, how therefore do we look at the, the capital receipts and how do we capture them for the benefit of London rather than them disappearing to, to the Treasury? Thank you. Simon? Yeah. Just two very quick points. The, the, the point about reinvest in sale proceeds I would go back to there's no shortage of capital currently and it should be based on clinical need because there's a danger that Chelsea would have the best primary health care because when it sells assets it's reinvested in that area so I think the argument is do you have a, a ring around a borough or around London or around the NHS nationally? And I think following this restructure, the first view was it was national. If, if, if something needs developing, it sits on its clinical merits rather than the, the sort of the windfall rollover capital gain. I think the second point, which to, to, to encourage people not to hold surplus and vacant assets, is to make sure the NHS picks up the cost of holding space yeah. and I think I can talk nationally when you say um, the deficit is coming down for the country you've got to have the mental model that it's as if the country's on an interest only mortgage nobody is paying back the capital yet so for the foreseeable future there is going to be financial pressure and it's this idea it's very similar to someone borrowing money to have a car and leaving it on the drive in case you might want to go somewhere it, 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 it's silly holding on to surplus and vacant assets but we've got to make sure the policies line up to push that obligation right down the system Thank you. Can I, yes, I'd just Tony. like to add one small point to that. In terms of thinking about the use of disposal receipts, we also have to bear in mind that we use the, those funds to address backlog maintenance and keeping existing buildings fit for purpose. So that's not just purely for investment. We have to have a first call on that money to ensure that the existing buildings, where they have an ongoing future, have Thank their you. backlog maintenance and, and fitness for purpose addressed as part of a rolling capital program. So there are other calls on those receipts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Or, I mean, could I? Yes, just a quick one. You know, I mean, this is all incredibly undemocratic, isn't it? The, the public aren't involved in any of these decisions at all. Does that strike you as right? Uh, 
I would argue that the point of the last reforms were about putting CCGs and clinical commissioners to decide on a clinical strategy in an area. CCGs, I think, have two lay members on each board. GPs act as advocates for their patient community. What, you know, I would argue the estate strategy can only follow the clinical strategies and the clinical strategies are being built up at a CCG level. So that's how I'd answer that. I'd, I'd support that in that our expectation for any business case that comes forward for the development of a new property, a new hub, would be that it would be sponsored by a CCG or by NHS England who have a, a responsibility of engagement with their local populations and therefore there would be some public involvement in that process. So we're only building on the back of that, we're not taking decisions in isolation. I think I would also add, which is important, on individual sites, ultimately they will have to go through planning. And, and clearly the, you know, the public has a voice on, on individual planning decisions. Um, I think what's really frustrating, though, if I was a member of the public, is to see an asset disposed of. I'm, I know I'm repeating the point, but it's an important point. is to see an asset disposed of and then traded, you know, speculated on in the market without... The, the, the NHS, in, in this case, having any leverage over what happens. It's surely better to procure someone through a framework um, and then, you know, and then guide that process through planning um, and, and be able to ensure that actually that, you know, if an asset is identified as surplus, at least it's some public good comes from that asset rather than it's speculated on in the market. Well, I think, you know, I think you've made a very, very strong case, but I'm not the wiser at the end of this. Uh, where we need to go. I mean, from my perspective in the London Commission, and the case has already been made, the estate will drive housing, which has a health value, will drive education and schools, which has a health value, will drive the economic growth, which has a health value, including the life sciences. Uh, we met the Deputy Mayor Kit Malta last week. You know, there are companies who wish to invest in London, and there is status is is an is an issue. I think the case you've already made, and Sam has made in relation to primary care, but also, you know, we completely forget that, you know, the big aging population challenge facing us. What about social care? We we we, you know, what do we need in, in terms of that? What's the new models of delivering nursing homes or 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 or, or whatever, and. Uh, and it seems, I mean, the case you're making, there's no one in charge. Uh, if a bank was running its assets like this, I suspect we won't, they won't be here. So I need some solutions. I mean, is there any way, we, we're thinking of commissioning pieces of work. We just don't want to go again through another procurement of a consulting firm to do another piece of work to tell us how much land we have, what is its worth, Without, I mean, for me, this is an unfinished business from 2007, yeah. London Framework for Action. You are well, you know, you've moved on and there is, so we need some leadership here without any institutional boundaries and things. I mean, you're making the case about the mayor running this. Is that the case? What? I, I, I'd yeah. just come back and say you need... You, you're right. I think a framework, yeah. but uh, because you've got mixed provision, yeah. you know, you could very much say it's like retail. Yeah. You know, we need why, why isn't all the retail space in London owned by one organisation that can do it? Well, it's never going to happen no. because you've got a mixed delivery model yeah. of retail. You've got a mixed delivery model of health and social care. Yeah. I think what we've got to do is to work on the framework, whether that's Department of Health. NHS England, the Mayor's Office, I, I think we, we've got to set the right environment without any sort of fundamental structural change, which you're always saying people pay for the space they use, which will drive them for the right decisions. Okay. I so, mean, if, yeah. Uh, yeah. just very briefly, I yeah. think if you, if you look across the GLA group, Transport for London, Metropolitan Police, London Fire Authority... Yeah, as part of the group, all of those have had to come up with a, a, a you know a well thought out um, asset strategy to help fund other services, you know, yeah. fund police officers or whatever. And um, but but they've clearly been able to do that uh, partly because they know that they will get the receipts. So I think in looking at this, I think there are two distinct things. The first is who keeps the cash, Wh yeah. whether it's paying off some of the maintenance costs or reinvesting in new services. I think that's a distinct element where it needs to be addressed and there needs to be a closer connection between 
you know, and greater incentive for, for you know, the owner to keep the asset, or for London in this case to keep to keep the return on, on on that asset. The second thing is, well, you know, what is the purpose of these estates? As I say, from a from from the outside, there is a clear lack of um, certainty over what the NHS itself believes it needs, and in terms of clinical. Uh, provision or, or, or reprovision, but I also know that there's over 100 hectares. This is, that's a vast amount of land. 100 hectares, which has been through planning to do something else in London. NHS estates to do something else in London. 100 hectares of NHS. 100 hectares. 100, NHS 110 hectares oh. of NHS-owned land that has gone through some form of planning dialogue to do something else. Sometimes it will be clinical reprovision. Sometimes it will be a mix of, you know, other, you know, housing to fund a new hospital. And all. And, and it seems enormously frustrating to me that actually there probably isn't much awareness of that 110 hectares, but there isn't much much control or coordination across that because it's not all the NHS Propco's land. And I think, you know, and I, I certainly think at the stage at which it's identified to do something else, then, you know, some a single body needs to be responsible for that to make sure we get the best outcomes. Uh, now, I'm putting forward that it should be the GLA on the basis that we're the largest public landowner in London. It could be a combination of the GLA and NHS Propco, but someone needs to be responsible for it, and that will bring more democratic accountability, it will bring more coordination, it will also bring better outcomes. Because at the moment, I know from that list of 110 hectares, there are sites on there where it's becoming almost a running joke that they keep reappearing and you know plans keep changing on them. Um, and, 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 and frankly, there's a real risk that, um, you know, in the end, they'll just be disposed of at, at poor value um, and, and, and not um, create the benefits that we'd want from them. Okay, thank you. Do you want to add something? Uh, I, I take Richard's point entirely about the need for more work around receipts. It's a major lack of incentives or a block in the system so I think that's really helpful and we'll take that away. I wanted just to pick up on the retail analogy and the issue of, of who's in charge. It struck me that if Simon and Tony were from Tesco um, or Waitrose um, it wouldn't be an unreasonable question to ask one of the largest organisations in the world what estate have you got in London? Um, who owns it? And what condition is it in? Uh, but it appears to me we're not able to answer. Yeah but they don't have empty shops. Those basic lying around. Tes Tesco is a good analogy because we where we've got 30 million square feet nationally, which is about the same size as Tesco. But if, if, you've, if they've got bigger stores than we have. But if you looked in the papers over the weekend, um, there's some bidders reckoning Tesco and Morrisons don't use their property um, to the best, uh, you know, shareholders are driving Tesco's and Morrison's to come up with another strategy about how they use their property. So that was an interesting debate in the Sunday papers. So. Just, just yeah. a small point to come back to Mr. Ridley on, on, on that one about the, the condition and the number of NHS property services assets in London. We do have that information for our estate. The point I was making earlier is it's a wider estate. We don't know how many GP-owned properties are out there. I don't know if anybody knows how many GP-owned properties are out there. And well, we do need to bring that, that all together. You don't to consider that as NHS space. This GP privately owned space is no different than Tesco's. It's just they're on primary care services there. Do you think that should be part of the NHS estate? I think we need I'm to count being, it yeah, so that we can owner, work out how yeah. services can be delivered in the most effective way. Okay. So we oh. need to understand where it is and what value it adds into the system yeah. so that we can take informed decisions as we go forward. Okay, thank you. And I just wanted to clarify that I think we're saying there's, there's two, two solutions being put forward. One is about creating some form of entity, either GLA or a joint venture of some kind, to provide single leadership to estate strategy in London for healthcare. So that's one approach. And I think the approach you were saying, Simon, was about... Uh, not having a structural uh, uh, solution, but getting the incentives right. Am I, am I yeah. saying that? Yeah. And, and are you, would you, your view be that a single entity is not required or wouldn't be helpful? I, 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 it, it's, it's how practically, given the complexities, we could get there. So you've got Monitor running Foundation Trust, you've got the NHS yeah. TDA running Aspirant Trust, you've got GPs, you've got Lyft, you've got NHS Property Services, you've got Surplus Land. I'm just trying to think what is, 
what is the first step along either you know if you could do both solutions great if you could you know it's a case of trying to unlock the complex problem Richard's outlined you, you know I mean I certainly think you know given that whole list of organizations who have some sort of say I mean that needs whatever happens that even if the title of the land doesn't transfer to a new entity or a different entity that needs to be simplified I mean I think the case just to be very clear I think I, I'm not convinced because we did discuss this whether there needs to be a separate entity and you know a new entity in London um, handling uh, the estate I, I but I, I do think there p could be a case that the GLA does on the basis that um, um, it is probably the largest public landowner in London. But also, if you look at what's happening in the rest of England, it, that role will be taken by the HCA. So I don't know why you wouldn't do the same, um, same here. Um, okay. Notwithstanding that, I think you know if it all <coughs> transferred to NHS Propco, and, and given the emerging and very strong relationship that we've got, that that would be perfectly acceptable. Okay. But at least someone's in charge. Okay. Well, that's a very clear message. So, do you think we can do this within the next three months? get a piece of work with some outputs, looking at the structures, <coughs> looking at the legislative powers, and looking at the functions uh, of the different players here to have a, it, you know, I think what Tony says is right. You have, you, you know more or less what's out there with the exception of primary care, but how do we translate that, is, that asset that we have into health gain, economic gain? Uh, I'm, I'm not, not. I mean, there's some recent legislation, and Richard may be better. This right to not right to contest, right to buy, or yeah, yeah. you know, any any member of the public can now write in and say, I think that land it's sat, sat right vacant, to right to build. You know, it's sat vacant. So I think the framework's there. I don't yeah. think we need anything else. It's just making sure everyone understands and we, we sort of shame some of the big players into you know why haven't you released yeah. that land what is your strategy okay. and um, they're, they're being administered by the cabinet office aren't they so you know there's another player on the pitch as well so it's yeah. understanding I think rather than creating anything new okay. understanding and navigating through this yeah that'd be great mm. a checklist and certainly on our part there's two sites we will attack Dulwich and Hornchurch where I think if we can working yeah, with yeah. NHS Propco, get those to market possibly within the next three months. Yeah. Uh, that starts to demonstrate actually that, you know, you know what, firstly what the potential is, but how, how it could be better handled and better yeah. coordinated. So I think some yeah. test cases are important to this yeah. as much as a kind of yeah. um, you know, theoretical framework. We also need to look at the economic opportunities here to invest in NHS London in yes. infrastructure because mm -hmm. and we need to look at that quite seriously because we're really going to drive the outputs of this commission in the interest of the public and the patients. We need some cash reinvested in the in London's healthcare. So on that note, so could I get our Jacob West who's sitting in the audience here to try and see whether we can organize a further meeting and really go through what are the next steps sure. before we end up doing another, as I said, you know, consulting a piece of work without mm. without really knowing what the questions are to get the right answers. Yeah. So okay. I'm very grateful for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you for being so open and honest and, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, telling us exactly what's wrong. Thank you. Thank right. you. Thanks.